I'll guide you in, in writing a Perl program. So you will be able to, to write your Perl. Okay, let's start. Metagenomics. So basically when you do metagenomics, you, um, you sequence basically and you don't know what every sequence should be seen as part of a whole biological community so basically it's sort of you s as as if you the the, the 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 whole sample is is like one community which depends uh, uh, on each other and so every sequence is part of that community with those sequences um, you have to always couple a lot of metadata and with metadata i mean the way you sampled, so basically the way you sampled, the moment you sampled, uh, a lot of environmental parameters like uh, temperature, um, type of soil, um, pH, uh, if it's in water, uh, in seawater, salinity, depth, and so forth and so forth. So, and, 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 and this is extremely important. So with that, the environmental metadata, actually your metagenomics is only worth half of what it's what it is thanks to those the many projects that that were that have been been run uh, already we start to get a better understanding of natural ecosystems but actually the whole at, at one side you have a lot of sequence you have this community but then with the metadata and so forth you get actually quite complex data that you have to integrate you have to be able to sort of put all this data together because as it, and, and very often it, it might simply fail at that level that you you miss metadata and and the things don't don't fit anymore so it's very important um, metagenomics actually uh, started with Greg Venter he's an uh, American scientist entrepreneur he he basically at some point as a sort of a teacher took his boat I went to the Sargasso Sea, and at that time he was already uh, relatively famous because he's also uh, behind the sequencing of the human genome. So, and he has an, an institute after his name and and so forth. So he has basically a whole institute behind him to support him. Uh, and what he did is he took his sailing boat and he went to the Sargasso Sea and uh, made some samples. Other project. Uh, a, a European project, the Tara, Tara Ocean project. That's basically uh, a little bit the same thing as what Greg Venter did, but much more, uh, with putting much more emphasis on the metadata. Actually, every sampling, they know exactly at what depth, what the temperature was of the water, uh, the, 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 the position of the sun, so basically the hour, every every parameter, salinity, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So the, the amount of of data that the Terra Ocean project produced is such that uh, earlier this year they published five uh, science papers analyzing 2% of the data. So much data they have. Other projects, uh, smaller scale, uh, are coming from soil, from mines, um, different types of uh, biotopes, um, fresh water, salt water, even the air, the air in, in was it New York or Boston that checked uh, what was in there? Actually, in Belgium, they should do it in above Brussels because we have some beers that are brewed in the open air. And then also on the human side, we start to do metagenomics, like uh, on feces. Basically, they, they studied the whole flora of your intestines in order to see what sort of organisms you have in there. And by doing this through metagenomics and analyzing and trying to identify the species, the species they, uh, they basically not only found a lot of new species, but also found out that there are, although it's controversial, I have to say, there are three types of, of uh, floras. And, the, and, and it depends on, on this flora, um, um, after more uh, research, we see that some, some deviants in, in the flora actually leads to some disease. Uh, also, so, some types of obes obesity is linked to your flora. Some diseases, cancer maybe not directly, but definitely a no, quite a number of, of, of diseases are linked to your flora. It's even so that then with horses, if you have a racing horses that worth, those are worth a lot of money, 
when they get sick, stomach aches, and it's hard, they don't manage to actually um, um, cure it. What they do, because the, the, the horse is much uh, worth a lot of money, is that they're going to look for a horse which has a very good digestive system. They're going to actually sample the flora in the horse, stomach and intestines. They're going to give a, an antibiotics to the racehorse, and they're going to inject the new f the flora from the other horse in that racehorse. In 99% of the cases, it solves all the problems. So you're really, basically, we're so depending on our, basically, gut <laughs> flora to live healthy. Um, it's, it's amazing. And we start only to discover this, that, that you can actually um, heal diseases simply by modifying the flora. Also, your skin. Typically, some, certainly on West, in, in the Western world, cleaning your skin too much is bad. If you wash yourself too much, too often, it's bad. Because on your skin you have bacteria. Whether you want it or not, you have bacteria. And if you wash them away too much, you open actually a biotope for other bacteria that are actually bad, could be bad. While if your skin is populated by nice bacteria that are okay to live on your skin, they, they occupy the niche, and this way, sometimes fungus cannot start growing on your skin. You, can, you don't get fungal, uh, uh, like red fungal uh, infections and things like that, simply because you have your bacteria. So washing yourself, well, not to, <laughs> you should. <laughs> you don't want to be dirty or whatever, and smelly and <laughs> all over the place. But anyway, washing is not so good. And, and in the same sense, uh, like, yeah. There's something else. Okay. So the Sargasso Sea. So the Sargasso Sea is, uh, where's my laser? Is, so here, I don't know if you see it. Here you have Europe, uh, Greenland, America, North America with Canada above here. Here you have the Caribbean, uh, Mexico, Central America, and the top of South America. So basically you have this sort of big circul circular current here, and the Sargasso Sea is, is, is actually here. So, um, so it's basically south of the Gulf Stream and north of, well, the stream that Columbus used to get into South America. And so Greg Venter, who is based in uh, around Washington, went with his boats, basically traveling in the Caribbean and in the Sargasso Sea. And he did a number of samplings. Can we switch off the lights maybe? Because I don't know if you, so now you see it better. So those are, uh, this is a, a satellite picture. The green that you see here, this is the level of uh, chlorophyll in the sea. So basically those are clouds of uh, algaes that are floating, algal um, um, plankton that is, that is floating around uh, here. Here you have the Bermudas and so forth. And so all the red dots are sampling stations. And so what Greg Venter did, so that was in, in the time that actually NGS didn't uh, exist, so that was still all uh, Sanger sequencing, um, but still they yield, yielded quite a lot of, of, of data, so quite a lot of uh, nucleotides. Um, and from after assembly, relatively, uh, well, still quite scattered, of course, uh, showed, showed um, the, basically the relative gene content. So basically this was a sort of a, a pilot project, you, you should say. So the, the, the relative uh, gene content, the diversity, and the relative abundance of different organisms across the different uh, sampling sites. So that basically by sequencing the content of your sample, you could actually compare different sites. You could see, well, in a site where we have where there's lots of light or where there's some currents, you have certain types of organisms and you have other types of organisms at other places. Like for instance here next to the Bahamas, you see you have a lot of green next to the Bahamas. Uh, given that people live on the Bahamas, it could well be that some basically nitrogen and other um, wastewater is actually uh, fermenting, um, fermenting, fertilizing the, the waters around the Bahamas and basically all those Fertilizing 
is, is beneficial for the growth of the bacteria of the uh, phytoplankton uh, in that area. And from all the sequencing that they did, um, they could potentially, or well, more or less, identify uh, 1,800 genomic species. And with genomic species, we mean pieces of sequences that are, uh, in terms of composition uh, and, and so forth, GC content, uh, are different. So that you have a good argument to say that they are, they are coming from different species. And from these, um, definitely uh, 148 were unrelated to anything that was known back then. And with this, they actually uncovered 1.2 1 million uh, proteins, unknown genes. Tara Ocean, so this is, those are the, uh, the color of the line are the different uh, expeditions. So they did, they did uh, an expedition in the Mediterranean Sea and all the way down to the Indian Ocean, uh, all the way down to Cape Town. Another expedition was going all the way down to the Antarctic and then going along South America to end up in Hawaii. And then another sampling uh, exped uh, expedition was going back, basically back to Europe. And then they refurbished the, because it's a sailing boat, they use a sailing boat for this. And uh, they, they had to refurbish the, the boat in order to be able to sustain the Arctic. And so basically they went around the world, around the North Pole, each time, at each point, sampling again and again. They found a, a, a big diversity because not only they sequenced, they also looked at their samples. So they found a huge diversity of, uh, like here, diatoms uh, that have those silica, nice and, and very special silica skeletons and other green algae and, and so forth and so forth. So, uh, and if you look here on this, this uh, site, so in, in the UK, you basically can access the data and it's huge, it's huge. And as, as I said before, basically only 2% of the data has been uh, analyzed. And, and, and by doing so, basically they have sort of a, what they declare is that by having done this, they have an, um, sort of time point zero of the condition of the oceans. And then actually from now on, they can again sort of sample around the world and they can start to see whether there's some fluctuations. Are there some species that are appearing? Are those disappearing? Is the number of species decreasing, increasing, and things like that? So they have a way to, um, to measure w what is going on in the environment. And one of the things that they uh, found out uh, studying the data is that actually temperature is the most important factor that will determine how much organism you will find. The warmer it is, actually, well, uh, until it's too cold, but the warmer it is, uh, the less organisms you, s you tend to find. So probably simply because in warmer waters, some nutrients dissolve uh, less goods, like CO2 and things like that. Like that. So it's, it's actually the, the richest seas is, is like the temperate areas. Um, what they also saw is that there is a quite a big difference in, in, in species in, between the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. You would say, why? Basically, there's a connection here. But the problem is, well, the thing is that, uh, and it's already well known from sailors uh, that were exploring the world, is that down here, like in the Sargasso Sea, you have this sort of kind of circle thing that goes around. Actually, you have a sort of the same thing here. And, what, and because of that, basically, the, 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 the organisms from the Indian Ocean get quite perturbed by this mixing of cold water and, and so on, which, which is actually a not so good environment for them because they're used to warmer waters. And, and this way, they have a hard time to cross. And it's the same thing for the, the organism in the Atlantic. So they have, so basically, there's some sort of a barrier here. That, that, and so all those kind of things they, 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 they discovered. Now, something that I, I did last year together with a student. I've, <clears throat> sorry, I've been working on quite a couple of algae. And in each project, the target was the algae. So basically, we wanted to sequence the algae. But the problem is that algae 
and not only algae, whatever you sequence actually, uh, has contaminants. And in each of those projects, well, you try to find those contexts that are contaminants and you want to throw them away. You just discard them You in the bin. Uh, and, and even, and certainly for algae, uh, even after years of culturing in the lab, and, and one of those algae that we've studied is, was 10 years cultured in the lab, still then that algae has bacteria with it. You, you, and, if, and as soon as you try to, you really use antibiotics to try to remove all those algae, basically the algae becomes sick and dies. So it lives with, it needs those, those bacteria. Um, and, and, and so you cannot have a sample without contaminants. But then here in this project, what we've done is actually turn the pro problem around. What if the algae was the contaminant and the rest is what we want to have? And so that was the idea of the whole project. And um, so here, how we did it. So basically we had an assembly, was we had Illumina sequencing data. And of course you have then uh, algae context, you have bacterial context. Um, and, and some pieces are really big and some others are small. But in order to use the concoct software, we had to sort of chop the, the, the bigger context back to 10 KB in order not to bias uh, our uh, calculations. And what we've done, what, what we did then is to map all the reads back again on each of those contexts. Oh yeah, and, and when we, 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 we chopped the larger contexts back to 10 KB, we always kept, of course, the reference of the original larger piece. Um, so we did, we mapped then back all the, the reads on, 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 on those contexts uh, in order to have the coverage and with the software, we also look at the composition, so KMERS. And this way, we, um, using the software, we were able to de delineate a number of clusters. And each, so basically each cluster is defined by its relative coverage and uh, the, the types of KMERS they share. And through this PCA analysis, we could actually find back everything which was Osteococcus, uh, the bigger cluster, and we removed them. And because it was not what uh, we wanted, and uh, we uh, analyzed further those uh, uh, separate clusters. And by analyzing, I mean we extracted each cluster, and all the reads that were Map, mapping on, on those in, 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 uh, on those reads, on those uh, contexts in this uh, cluster, reassembled again in order to see whether we get uh, um, um, a better assembly. Also, what we've done while working with, with, with those uh, clusters is to see, based on uh, an, an, a set of 36 single copy genes that we know are really single copy genes in, uh, uh, in uh, the green lineage, they're somehow a bit biased to uh, one specific pathway, but anyway, um, and, and by looking if within a cluster we could find homologies, so basically running simply a blast X, we, we, we looked whether uh, we could see find all 36 of those genes. If we could find all 36 of the genes, then we could sort of think that we probably have a complete genome. So basically, so each number here is an, another cluster, and like cluster number one is definitely, according to this 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 proxy, uh, an, uh, a complete genome. Um, using Megan Five, we've also tried to to uh, evaluate or to see whether we could put a name on those different uh, contaminants. Well, the, the different bacteria that we could, uh, that we, we, we found. So quite a number were unclassified, so we couldn't, couldn't identify, we have no clue what it is. But for others, and we had still some Osteococcus, and Batticoccus is a, a, a related uh, algae to the Osteococcus. Um, so we still had a few sequences from Osteococcus in the data set, but for the rest, Okay, so, um, and, and, and 
So what was I saying? Okay. So so that the all the chromosomes have their own little compartment in the nucleus. It's not all over the place. And um, the way that this uh, technique works is by um, cross-linking the DNA wherever it touches each other. So basically, if you have a chromosome in, in a nucleus, at some, some places it will be sort of attached to the, uh, the, to the, the, the membrane of the nucleus, and there, there will be big loops. And, 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 and everywhere with, where, where the DNA comes together again, making big loops, um, you're going to cross-link it using formaldehyde. So you're going to cross-link all this DNA so that it basically is um, chemically attached, so that it doesn't get loose anymore. And what you can do then is So here it's attached, uh, and what you do then is you extract the DNA and you digest it. So basically, you chop off all the loops that you, you that were in, in the DNA, and um, after uh, chopping off the loops, you uh, make a ligation again, so that you make little circles, circular uh, molecules, and every of those um, little molecules. You're gonna send. Well, those are the different names of, of, of the, the different technologies uh, or the different protocols, um, and you will sequence all those little bits and pieces. And what you get then is that um, suppose that those are different contexts here, and you will have basically bits and pieces of sequence that will connect in different ways the the, the, the contexts. And in order to and, and, and so, so basically you get, because one thing you have to keep in mind, uh, compared to mate pairs, um, with mate pairs you try to have an as constant as possible insert size. Here, you, ha you don't have this insert size. You, you don't know. So basically some reads can be very close to each other physically. Some other reads can uh, be like one megabase, several megabase away from each other. So that means that some of those read pairs, because here you, on, on those you just do pair then sequencing. Yeah? Um, also on those, with those pairs, some will basically connect very close, some very far, etc. And and what you and what and if you plot all those connections in a matrix, you see that basically most of the connections happen on uh, on the diagonal, also showing that the the, the, the most of the those pairs are belonging to one and the same uh, chromosome. And the whole trick is then to actually untangle all those connections. You want to make the whole set of connections as simple as possible. And by doing so, you can actually reassemble all the contexts that you you did you already had from 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 regular sequencing that we saw uh, a couple of days ago, you can actually scaffold using this method. So so basically this is one technology one one application of 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 this technology. But given that um, you have this kind of cross-linking of of, of 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 all the DNA, you can actually apply the same thing in metagenomics. If you have now an eukaryotic or um, a prokaryotic with uh, with uh, some 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 plasmids or without, basically if you do the same technique, because also this cross-linking, you do on the living organisms. So you don't break the organisms. You just put the formaldehyde on the organisms, and uh, and it will basically kill the organism, of course. But all the DNA will be cross-linked. So, um, and if you do then, from your metagenomic sample, you apply this this, this formaldehyde, you will, and and you apply the, the same type of sequencing, you will basically after uh, um, shotgun have basically a set of sequences, and um, when you. Uh, 
on, 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 on those uh, sequences, basically you will find back all those connections again. So basically all everything that belongs to one and the same organism will be interconnected. And it's even so that um, that uh, they made an experiment. They took 12 different yeasts. They put it all in the same um, in the same uh, um, flask. They let them grow. Everything is mixed. Everything, uh, all the yeasts are living nicely together. And then they sampled um, from 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 this big flask, and they started to sequence um, the the way I just explained. And basically, every dot here is a contact, and every edge, so every line that connects the dots, is the result from this high C sequencing. And by doing so, even though they didn't split the the, the chromosome, the, 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 the organisms beforehand, they were able to actually cluster again all the contacts according to the species. And after looking again, they could actually see which which cluster was which species. So if you have an, an environmental um, um, sample which is not too rich in in terms of species, definitely this way you could act, uh, you could identify the whole genome of all those organisms, and you don't and even if they not you cannot culture them, you can just take a sample. You do this the, the you, you apply the whole uh, methodology, you do your sequencing and you will obtain clusters of complete, uh, complete uh, genomes. Um, the advantage of doing this is that um, afterwards, if you want to just to sam sample as a, as a sort of diagnostic sampling, so you sample uh, the, the same soil, let's say after some pollution or something that happened or, or just a year later, you actually don't have to do this whole thing anymore. You can do, just do the sequencing again. And given that you will have the reference genome, you will be able to map everything back again on those genomes, and you will be able to quantify how much I have from each of those genomes. So, um, and if still, if you have would have a new species popping up, of course, you would have to redo the whole the whole the whole thing. But this way, you you have quite a, a, a nice uh, system to uh, to identify complete microorganisms that you cannot culture. OK. Systems biology. Um, and uh, systems and integrative, so to integrate uh, many data. So actually, systems by all the, the ideas is, is already quite old, uh, because basically, even in the early 1900s, people were already completely convinced that organisms don't live on their own. It's not like one organism and then the other one, and that everything is depending on each other, and that that it, there is mutual interaction, there is parasitism, and and so on and so forth, and that basically all life on Earth depends on each other. Um, and and. Um, and, 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 and also this, this, this whole interaction is, is, is a whole mechanism which is in a sort of com um, perpetuum mobile. So it's, it's always fluctuating and it's moving and, and it's, 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 it's quite, quite a, a complex system to actually, or me me that, that, that has almost some mechanical, not, maybe not mecha mechanical, but like, um, it's like a big electrical circuit. If you take a computer, you open it, you look at the motherboard, basically every point might be an organism. And everything is interconnected. Um, and, and also, uh, well, we had basically in the early, well, it's not a nice period for Germany, but in the, there were some good scientists in Germany back then. Um, um, and uh, yeah, that's this one is French. <laughs> um, but one thing that they didn't had all those guys is this. Basically, they didn't had the machines. 
and then the, all, all, all those big ideas about um, 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 systems biology and everything was, was pure uh, um, philosophical because they didn't have the data and they had no ways in order to get some, some data. So, um, but now, nowadays, we basically have all those machines. We have big computers. Um, we can automate um, cell cultures. We have HPLC and mass spec. Uh, we have, uh, of course, PCR machines, sequencing machines, uh, even more modern machines than those, um, and, 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 and so forth and so forth, and microarrays for expression. And it's actually um, Lee Hood who sort of um, gave a, a sort of a, a new elan to the whole uh, systems biology, where basically um, he also said, well, system biology uh, is a study of biological systems, um, and, and by systematically perturbing those systems, you will start to unravel the connections, the interactions, and, the, and ultimately, basically, in, in his mind, even say that you could have a mathematical model of the whole system, basically reducing it to really a, a sort of a circuit board. And then, actually, um, um, and, and, and also, and, and, uh, also by, 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 um, by trying to perturb and, and test all those things, uh, and certainly uh, Leroy Hood, he, he moved back, he, he went even a, a step further, where he started to create an artificial organism to see what ha what happens. To put an artificial organism, so a synthet synthetic bacteria, in a system in order to perturb the, the equilibrium by, by introducing an alien. But all this means that we have a lot of data um, and 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 we have all those genomes, and we can do all this. We have all this annotation, all those genes. Uh, we can do comparative analysis, and so forth, and so forth. But in order to um, have, um, so we have annotation. Uh, and, and, and basically, the whole challenge of systems biology is actually that we have the parts, and we have most of the parts, actually, because in, 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 in reality, we don't, we don't have all the bits and pieces. We definitely miss quite a lot of um, tiny little parts. But basically, if this are the parts, um, actually, um, here, this is just the, the, the gears for the, for the bike. So, and, and this is what systems biology is about, using a whole set of technologies in order to um, identify, describe all the parts, but the system biology needs to put all these parts together in order to make a system. So, and, 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 and here again, metabolic pathways, for instance, are already looking a, a much like a circuit board. So, and, and this is all, um, knowledge that we, we acquired, and, and um, this is linked to, to, to regulating, um, so those conserved non-coding regions that you have in the promoter sequences on which uh, transcription factors can bind, will regulate those genes, and you will have sometimes simple systems, but sometimes you have quite complex uh, sets of regulators, which means that they might, the same genes might basically be um, active on different um, on different points in in those pathways in those networks, and um, and then uh, also with expression data, you can see which genes are co-expressed and and which which genes are linked uh, with each other. So among other data, so expression data, I already said. So in the early times that was microarray, but also uh, protein gels, basically are important and can be uh, um, can be integrated in all those uh, in all this data because actually um, microarrays and, and rna seq um, they measure the um, the expression at the rna level
but that doesn't mean that uh, the, the protein will have a, an, the exact same amount. As, as I said already before, uh, depending on the the, 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 the the transcript, some will live a little bit longer, some will live less, and because of that, even if you have a less highly expressed or transcribed uh, RNA, you might still have a decent amount of proteins. So all those things need to be integrated um, in, 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 uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in sort of a, a huge database network with, with everything interconnected. Uh, here you have uh, different, each track is uh, um, from an HPLC, so each peak is a certain component uh, that that's, that is was present in in a sample, and each horizontal line is is another experiment. And you see that you have quite a lot of fluctuations in in in, in chemicals that you have present in in a cell. And so basically, that means that all these different types of data, so pathways and uh, net uh, interact. Um, uh, expression networks, protein-protein interactions, um, and, and also um, actually um, literature, because a lot has been published about little interactions between two genes. And all this knowledge is actually in text. So that means that even here, text mining is important in order to actually recover everything, what, all the work that was done before in, in the last couple of decades, uh, it, it contains a, a, a quite a lot of very interesting uh, data. And all this, basically, we have to feed it to a certain machine, and, um, and, and this machine needs to be, to spit out an, uh, um, some models and, and, and try to connect and interconnect everything together. Um, is, are there any questions? Please, shoot. Mm -hmm. No, no, nothing? OK. Um, and, and so basically, you have to make uh, networks. And, 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 and this is, of course, quite mathematical, um, because you have to be able to analyze those networks. You have to be able to, because those networks are huge. They contain like, like uh, for one genome, it would be easily 30,000 dots that are all interconnected. So you cannot eyeball those, those networks, because you're going to be flooded by information. So you definitely need to, um, uh, need to have uh, good knowledge of programming and computers in order to decipher and actually identify things that are together. Typically, um, if you have uh, basically this sort of big network, sometimes you want to do compare those networks. And you might have mild differences. And then you have to have um, systems and, and methods to actually analyze these. Also, there's some um, special levels in, 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 in those networks. Typically, so you have party hubs, as we call them, and this is like a gene, which is interconnected with a whole set of genes, but the only connection with this set of genes is through this party hub. Then we have, um, and here we have another party hub, and then we have here a date hub, which basically is even more uh, centralized in the whole network. Um, and um, is 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 um, and and oh yeah and and so basically um, if you have such a network and you and and it's based on expression data for bi if you go back then to the biology it's very important if if you would have a perfect network and an understanding of how the network works you would be able to understand which gene for instance you have to attack in order to sort of break a certain pathway. Uh, it, it, it's, there's no point in, in, in actually uh, making knockout of this gene. It will have a minor effect. With this, if you knock out this gene, basically the, this whole set will disappear. 
if you would make a knockout, basically a whole part of your whole network would suddenly collapse. So if you have, if, you, if you're able to integrate all those different types of data and and build networks from this and hopefully good networks and understand your network, then for biologists, this is basically a gold mine because this is the basis of your system. This is how your genes are interconnected. Um, but the problem is that we have such diverse data that it's actually very difficult to, um, to put them all in relationship. Because also, what, because we have, um, we have differential uh, expression, we, ha um, we have uh, different data sets, different platforms, uh, slightly different experiments. We have um, yeast to hybrid tap with, for protein interactions. Uh, we have chip data, we have promoter motives, uh, the gene expression, um, and then we can use all sorts of clusterings and so forth. But the, the, the big problem is that for the systems biology uh, is, is more that we, um, all those experiments were done separately on the same organism. And, uh, but that means that you have to approximate the, approximate the, 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 the data in order to make it overlap. Because it was not sampled, all those data were not generated at exactly the same point from the same sample on the same data. This is something that, that, that for the moment, system biology is a bit suffering from. Um, and um, so here again, we have this sort of uh, plot um, which which tells you how accurate the data is. So also, you have to put a certain weight on, on the different types of data. Some data are more reliable than others. So that means that some, some methods have more weight in your whole calculations compared to others. And um, like yeast to hybrid doesn't have a very high accuracy. It's actually yeast to hybrid has a lot of uh, false positives, a lot of noise. And uh, actually, we, we, we talked about uh, Leroy Hood. He, in, his, in, in one of his first experiments that he did using two, yeast to hybrid, um, was actually, he had to do his experiment 1,000 times in order to be able to discard noise. So, um, so, so much noise you have in in, uh, in 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 this uh, with this data set. Um, um, also, with RNAs, um, the correlating the, this data with 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 mRNA, as I said, the amount of protein is not entirely co uh, correlated with 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 uh, the amount of of uh, of proteins. Um, also, in silico predictions, well, it should be, I would say, more, even more horizontal, but there's also quite a lot of um, problems there. So, basically, um, what you try to do when, uh, when you want to study this is that you have a number of what is called properties. Um, which are actually so all the types of data, so protein-protein interaction, uh, uh, microarray data, uh, HPLC, and so forth. And then you have your list of genes, and you will connect for each different, so each color could be a different property, and you will basically connect each gene with a certain property. So in, 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 in the sense, Putting, setting up the data is, is not that difficult. But the problem is that you have then to analyze it. And here you have, an, an, for instance, uh, a matrix. If you would put this into a matrix, 
here you have a set of genes, and here you have all the types of data and experiments that were there, and you have to be able to try to find patterns in, in, in this sort of matrix. And for this, you, you, there's some software that that exists in order to that, that basically tries to come up with some solutions. Um, and but but then also is that the when you're integrating all those data, um, the problem is that um, there's quite some software that tries to solve the problem. But it appears that currently, because the, the, it's not a push-button system. So systems biology is far from being push-button. You download the software, you, put, you dump your data in there, and, and you analyze it. Uh, and and, and that you can see this by, by using different software. And different software will come to slightly different results. And that is simply because in order to, um, um, to, to process the data, as I said, some, some, you have to uh, put a weight on, on, on those uh, dip, different types of data. And depending on the, the weight you put on there in, in one or the other software might lead to slightly different results. So it's, it's, there's still quite a lot of work to be done. Um, here, uh, also, um, all different types of data. And actually, um, from all the statistics that you can do, you always have quite a lot of uh, outliers and, 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 and things that are less useful. And it's only the data that basically ends up in this little corner that is, is sort of uh, usable. But that means that you, because here you have a number of those bigger uh, pink dots, that means that you also lose a lot of data. And therefore, you will try to use some um, Bayesian and other probabilistic methods uh, in order to um, um, do some machine learning in order to actually um, 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 re regain those or, or take those points that here on this in this matrix are now excluded to still incorporate them in, in your analysis. But the problem is that in order to be able to do this, you need to have a golden standard. This is machine learning. So this is, you need, again, like, like with, with, with gene prediction, you need to have a data set of true, posit of true and a, a, data, a data set of true negatives and true positives. And you have to have a system that actually can find a pattern and learn how to distinguish true from false. Here, um, basically, this is uh, an, uh, another network. From uh, each block is actually a paper, and you see all the lines are the co-authorships and, and so on. And you see this way how uh, a social network can be built, uh, basically, on based on, on and, and this is sort of what you also want to do with genes, huh? where basically you would have a system here, a system there. And you have a number of genes, and those genes are interconnected with each other. Um, also, there's some nice tools that uh, are available to, to visualize and to play with this data. And one of them is uh, Cytoscape. Um, and uh, Cytoscape, basically, um, you can feed those um, files um, this type of data sets. So basically, if you would put it in a file, it's a, um, a file with two columns, with one column the name of a gene, and the other uh, column will be a property. And everything which is on the same line is, is basically connected. So that means that uh, a gene can occur more than once uh, in, uh, in the list. But then you can load it in this type of software. And it, this software will build uh, a whole, a whole network um, of of your data. So and it's it's quite 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 uh, a nice software, quite intuitive to use. So definitely, if you have things that you could um, 
interconnect. Uh, this is quite a nice, uh, quite a nice um, tool to use. Um, yeah. Also, um, currently, because of the complexity of the problems, system biology is not yet like genome-wide, um, because we can only solve subparts of the system for the moment. So you can s solve different subparts of the whole genome, but have the whole network for a whole genome is not yet uh, possible with, with, with the knowledge, with the data, and, and with the, the, the things that we know and, and that we can actually um, extract from the data. So basically, that means that we have to focus on more, uh, on more um, focused uh, uh, parts of the whole network. And here, typically, you have a pathway. And this is something that you can um, um, extract and, and from, from other knowledge. And basically, um, the nice thing also with, with, with uh, those sort of more focused areas is that um, you can actually propose new interactions. Because the whole thing needs to work. And you can test the whole network. And, and by uh, having some genes, basically, that are less known, or we, where the interaction is, is not very well, not very clear, um, a systems biology on a very defined area can actually um, help and, and propose some hypothesis in, in what's, what, what's, what is happening in the network. Like here, this GAL6 is proposed to, to inhibit uh, GAL4 in this uh, galactose uh, glucose um, um, pathway. Um, and uh, also for Drosophila, for instance, they also um, tried to make uh, a whole network, a whole developmental network. So see which gene is important for the whole development of the Drosophila, of the fly. Here you have, for instance, uh, GFP and, and, and YFP and, and so on uh, labeled genes. And you have the different disks that you have in the egg, a developing egg of a, of a fly. And you see all those different uh, disks appearing. So those genes appear in, in, in this. Then you have other genes that typically appear on one end. And, 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 and yeah, this is not so visible, but form a gradient. And from the other end, again, a gradient. Or at, are localized at the bottom rather than, than anywhere else. Um, and then you, you try to. Um, have in vivo and in vitro uh, find DNA binding, so that's with ChIPSEC, uh, DNA binding sites, in order to see which transcription factor might initiate the expression of the genes that are needed for the, expre uh, for, for the development. Um, and then here you have such a, um, a labeled uh, um, gene protein that, that you can see is, is clearly divided over different places. And of course, in order to do this, you need to analyze hundreds and hundreds of genes and, and do a lot of th uh, testing and experiments. And, and then, then comes, uh, come uh, some engineers in order to make uh, some, some automation uh, in order to, make, to collect the data. Um, here, another uh, project is, is to sort of understand uh, pheromones in, uh, in, in yeast, and where you basically have a set of genes, and then you apply the pheromone, and you see what sort of uh, effect this pheromone, pheromone has on, 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 the, uh, on, on the organism. So here, another quote. 
nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Um, so, and, and here then comes again comparative. So, so what we've saw, what, what what we've seen for the moment mostly was all different types of data that was was collected um, on a certain organism. If it was uh, Drosophila, it was yeast, it was uh, Arabidopsis. Everything was basically focused on one organism. But actually, there's also a lot of power in 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 um, in comparative analysis. If you would again um, be able to sort of merge uh, two different organisms, uh, some 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 overlaps will emerge from from this, and and you will see some where where in your network you have more like evolvability. Um, so basically network parts of your network that are looser connected and where ev evolution has more impact because there's more freedom. Other parts of your network will be very robust. You cannot change them. They're, they're very essential in the whole system. They're, they're holding different parts of the system together. Um, and, and, so, and, and so basically we have to sort of um, look at the evolution of those biological networks and, 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 and then we can integrate also phenotypes and this way of, uh, basically compare organisms. So basically, currently we were talking about this part, but we have to add this additional dimension, which is the comparative analysis. Um, and, and here, we see where, where that was done with uh, yeast again, because yeast is, is much more easy. You, s you see that, that basically a lot of between two yeasts, so this, uh, yeah, I, I didn't. So one of the two is Pombe and the other is Cerevisiae. Um, basically, you see that most of the genes are have little overlap, only like 30% overlap. So most of the genes in those two uh, organisms have, uh, or, or the network, let's say, has basically is different. And and um, so here we have sort of an um, evolution of what sort of data um, we we started to collect. So basically, in the 60s, you only had protein sequences, Sanger sequencing. So you have um, those um, 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 alignment methods. You had the mat com comparison of matrices, another alignment method, um, the emergence of, of the, 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 the databases. So um, in the 80s, actually, as internet was not that fast as it is now, um, those databases were distributed to the labs on CDs and then DVDs. Uh, nowadays, uh, it doesn't fit on any of those media. Um, then you have some, some, yeah, some people that did some, some, some important uh, steps. Blast software. This database became too big to actually search it. And then the BLAST software um, came out. Here you have uh, different, um, as another timeline where um, um, statistical methods and, 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 uh, were developed, basically. Um, so here you, um, you have sort of the mathematical um, establishment of transition uh, probabilities. Uh, dynamic programming was implemented for al alignments. Um, uh, motifs, Markov models linked to the, 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 the speech recognition, etc. Um, other types of, of uh, building your database and, and querying your database has been uh, developed. Like nowadays, for this 
systems biology, you will not use uh, a database system like MySQL. I don't know if you know if, if that name rings a bell. Uh, but MySQL is basically, or Oracle or whatsoever, so a relational database is actually unable to deal with this type of data. It's too complex. You would be able to store it in a database, but then you would not be able to query it anymore because you would have to make so many joins between different tables that the system will, will basically crash. So you need to, uh, and, and you need to have other ways of, of building, of putting together your database and um, a new way of uh, arranging your data is actually um, was co-evolving evol uh, co with, with the building of those networks because you will have now SQL-free databases and, 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 um, and those databases are actually like a big network that you can interrogate. So, and this is a whole new way of uh, storing the data and, and, uh, and interrogating the data. And, and in, in NoSQL or Semantic Web, um, you can actually interrogate this, this diversity of data very quickly, something that the relational databases cannot handle. Um, here are more types of data that you can integrate, like um, you have transcription factors with software that can be used to predict them um, and, and so forth, so all those data. And then what you start to do is, is trying to connect everything together in order to have a, a whole circuit that could actually explain life. Here, again, uh, some comparison between Cerevisi and Pombe, um, where basically you see that only two, 30 here, in this sort of per perturbation, uh, 32 genes were in common. Uh, here, 115, with, with quite severe p-values. Um, so quite reliable ones. So we have 114 here in those conditions, 40 here in common, 45 here in common, which share the, the, the same motifs also. When you look here, the motifs are, uh, well, at least somehow, uh, are can be correlated. Um, we've seen also, uh, I've talked about whole, ge whole uh, genome duplications. And here also, when you look at the, the whole system, you see that basically in yeast, even in yeast, we had whole genome duplication. And what we see that those that underwent this whole genome duplication basically can live in an anaerob anaerobic uh, environment, while the others, the ancestral ones, only were living in, in the air. They need oxygen. Those could survive without oxygen. And actually, those are the ones that are in interesting for us uh, because uh, they, um, among them, I don't know if it's listed somewhere. Well, those are all Saccharomyces. Yeah, Cerevisia is here. So this is the one that you use for bread, for, for fermenting, uh, uh, all sorts of things. So basically, all those bacteria are you can use to ferment. All, all different types of, of foods that, and drinks that we have. Here, again, sea urchin. Again, here also are the developments. So the, 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 the nice thing, a bit like with Drosophila, is that the developing egg of a sea urchin is transparent and that you can easily, relatively easily, uh, label and visualize those genes uh, while they, they do their work. And basically here you have some Hox genes uh, that are in there that, we, that, that, that are typical for development and for the segmentation of, of, of the bodies. Uh, we also have them. Um, you see that basically they managed to make like really here a circuit of all the genes that are needed in order to, to develop. And then you can go even further is actually a project where you make little robots. This is, this is not biology. This is little robots. And they can 
connect with each other and they have uh, some sensors and they can share information, they can share uh, energy and um, our, because we were involved in this, our um, um, part of, the, of, of, of our, our task in the project was to develop um, a sort of um, a genome where basically you have a genome of zeros and ones that you read in, in, in packages like, like you have with codons and um, if you have at certain positions an, a one or a zero you will activate uh, a, um, a, the, the package which is next to it and this package which is next to it is actually the address of a little program that will for instance um, allow the, 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 the or that will sort of regulate uh, some part of the of the little robot and the whole idea or the way the, the project was sold is that if suppose you can make those little robots that which would be like well, or it which would be like five or ten centimeters square and you would be able to put all lit, all sort of little sensors or battery they can move they have little wheels um, so they can crawl over the over the, the place and we make it such that they can interconnect in order to make a super organism to make a swarm basically like like ants ants that want to cross uh, a river for instance they can actually at basically hold each other together and go and, and this way build a bridge from one place to the other let a whole colony pass and then basically the bridge will decompose again in order to have everybody passing a little river for instance and so this is the whole idea behind this project is to basically build those uh, such a synthetic system the only problem because the project is, is finished is that the engineers got crazy in the sense that they wanted to have more and more and more sensors because they had they wanted to add more sensors we had to make the the robots bigger uh, because the robot become became bigger it needed a bigger engine in order to be able to move because the engine was bigger they needed a bigger battery and so forth and so forth and in the end um, one one little robot uh, because the idea was also to make as many robots as possible to have a real swarm is that in the end we only had one robot and the one robot was already, already way too expensive to actually make a second one <laughs> so but nevertheless um, um, Yao Yao is the, 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 the PhD student uh, in informatics then who uh, worked with uh, in our lab to actually uh, develop this 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 genome actually um, because the engineers were just crazy in, in, in building uh, this robot, uh, we he uh, developed uh, his, his his genome uh, basically uh, in silico, so in, in in memory of a computer, and tried to have uh, basically uh, like a, a virtual little robot which has a genome and that basically the things could go uh, along. So he, he he managed to do this and and. He actually defended his PhD uh, last week uh, on this on this project, um, and then of course all this 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 sort of system and and implementing it is basically also a way to create robots that could look like more or less like us and could interact with us and could sort of evolve and learn and, 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 and do things together. Like here you have little robots that play football and they have to be able to learn to, to, to play in a team. Um, so, yeah, in, in at the uh, ICSB, meeting in 2008 basically they sort of defined systems biology as being uh, molecular biology in the omics era um, it's highly interdisciplinary 
So you need to have, like, if you want to make those robots, you need engineers. But also, in order to build the machines for uh, um, for for your um, to, to, to be able to make your measurements, you need engineers. You need people in hardcore informaticians to model and and to to to, 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 to digest the whole data, and you need of course biologists that can lead the informaticians and manipulate the, the organisms in order to produce the data and to make the interpretation. Um, and basically, we move now from the pet gene to a pet pathway or a pet process. Basically, molecular biologists, well, you still need them, of course, to, for to elucidate uh, some genes and, and that are working on genes. But now it's much more efficient to, to actually go in through pathways and processes because then you will be able to capture new genes and and um, and um, uh, analyze processes. Okay, I'm almost. Um, now I, I'm, I'm completely changing gears because that was the little part that wasn't finished yesterday. So I've glued it at the end here. Um, and so this is also, again, more related to, um, to annotation. And this is a tool that we have back in Belgium. The genome view, that one, you've already played a bit with it. Uh, and then we have this ORCI for online resource for community annotation of eukaryotes uh, that we set up for the genomes we work on. And um, it's simply because, as I said uh, yesterday, annotation, our gene prediction remains a prediction, so there's some errors in there. And uh, also, um, in order to publish, you need to have a good biological story to tell. Just sequencing and, and annotating a genome is definitely not sufficient anymore to publish. Um, you need people to actually look a little bit at the data. So what we try to do here behind this is, is try to digest as much as possible data so that biologists basically can browse through the genome and have direct access to, to several types of data. Um, and we have already more than 30 or 40 genomes uh, in the system. So here we have, for instance, uh, the tomato. So uh, we were involved in the, in the annotation of the whole tomato genome. Um, and um, so the whole interface offers BLAST text searches for all the things that we added, uh, add as descriptions. Uh, there's a wiki, so DocuWiki, so that's uh, a website, a bit like a blog, where people can write uh, their, uh, their comments. Uh, it can be used, actually, even to write the paper, because it's sort of centralized and everybody has access to the same text. Um, there's a download, so for people that want to download the, some parts of the data to do some more extensive analysis on their local system. Um, and so because it's all through a central uh, website, it's all centralized. So basically, whoever makes a change in the database, everybody else in the community has access to it directly. Um, it's password protected, certainly. When it's a new genome and people want to uh, to uh, um, to work with it without having some other people stealing information and data, so while you're preparing your paper, uh, you will have a password so that only uh, those that are um, granted access can actually see the data. Um, there's a lot of pre-computed analysis behind it. Um, and it's a sort of, yeah, it's a gene-centric system. Also, um, the thing that we implemented is that uh, it's, uh, so you can make all sorts of changes, but nothing is ever discarded. 
you never delete anything. So basically, we keep track of all changes so that uh, everybody, anybody can actually go back to, um, to, to, uh, to the, 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 the a previous status of, of the data. This is how such a page looks like. So you have some gene ideas, you have uh, a, a gene description. Um, who did the annotation, so the, for the software in this case, or if it's a person, uh, the person will have his email there. So if you, someone else would disagree with the changes that this person did, um, he can, he or she can, can actually contact the person directly so they can exchange their views. Um, you will have descriptions so you can add even links to articles, the EC numbers, if you have pathways, um, you can all add this. You can have a gene ontology, um, protein domains, will be pre-calculated. So unfortunately, there's no gene ontology here, but this is also pre-calculated. Here you see the description of the different genes. Um, we pre-calculate we pre we pre blast, research, uh, blast searches so that you can compare the genes um, within the genome, so to, to, to basically find gene families, um, to reference databases, reference protein databases, given that we're looking at the plant, we added aerodopsis as a reference, and just the general NCBI to see whether you have links with anything else. There's also multiple alignments that are done automatically with some rudimentary uh, phylogenetic trees, so you can see right away the relationship between those genes that you collect. The structure of the genes, of course, um, and Although here you see the coordinates, uh, you cannot change those coordinates. If you want to change the gene model, you will have to go to genome view and play with, go via genome view uh, and the sequences. So as I said, you have genome view and then uh, with this browser you can modify gene models uh, by dragging the borders of genes, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and also, um, what you see is that when you look at different, so this is the same gene, exactly the same gene, goes for the same protein, so those are orthologs, and if you look at the gene structure going from a brown algae and two different green plants, so this is a, a tree and this is a, a bush, more, well, a herb, or even, um, you see that actually even though they code for the same protein, they have quite a different way of uh, splicing, um, and that was also one of the reasons why you need to retrain the software. Um, so we have different sources that we um, break into this, and given that with prediction you can have quite broken, sometimes broken genes or um, sometimes fused genes, but broken genes is the more common uh, issue. Um, we, we have this interface uh, for user communities to not only exchange data, but also um, on a sort of continuous uh, base um, improve the data. Some other little things that we've done recently uh, some that have some spectacular things. So this is the osteococcus. I've talked about it before. So this is a starch granule. You have the nucleus here. I think this is the chloroplast and the mitochondrion should be somewhere here. Um, and then we've, I've talked about uh, the tranicus, spider mites. So this is a spider mite. The real size is basically the head of a needle. And then we looked at another mite and this one is there. So even this one, you don't see the legs. You see just a little yellow dot crawling over the leaves. And here you have one that is actually even smaller than a leg of this. And I don't want to scare people, but um, at least in North America, they've tested uh, the skin of people. And 
in almost 100% of the people they tested, there was also sort of a little mite like this that is living on your skin. It eats fungus and all those kind of things. Dead, dead skin and, and so on. <laughs> um, oh yeah. So what's so peculiar about Osteococcus? Um, it's small, 12 megabase uh, genome, 20 chromosomes, around 8,000 genes. Most of the genes are single copy, and um, most of the genes are even single exon. And there's one thing that we discovered when we were analyzing this, this, this genome, is that on uh, chromosome two, we had one region which was completely different from anything else in the genome. This chromosome 19 is a, is a bit of an odd thing, because there we, we don't know what it is. It's, it's, it's a, a complete mess. Uh, but this region was nicely assembled. And we have, meanwhile, four different strains or species from Osteococcus coming from different places. And they all show the same uh, feature. Uh, and even the related uh, Micromonas and Batticoccus also share this feature. And what you see in, is that in this region here, you have genes with lots of small introns, exons, basically highly spliced, while all the rest, the genes are like single ores. So basically, you have quite a little big difference. Also, when we look across the different strains, we see that pretty much all the chromosomes are collinear. Basically, you can align the chromosomes. They're highly conserved, even though they're different species, except this part. Nothing aligns here. So basically, this part is probably a species uh, limiting factor, because this one cannot hybridize uh, with, with an, uh, during uh, the mating. So there's no way that this can be sort of shared. Also, the content, when you look at the four different strains, content of this area is different. Some, some genes in one species that is located in this area with lots of introns and exons might be in another species on a completely different chromosome and, and occur like one of these. And Aculops, also uh, this small organism here, the small, it's, a, it's a small mite. It's also a tiny little chromosome, uh, uh, genome. And here, also, you have basically most of the genes are single exon. Um, we have here a little bit more genes, but it's the same amount of genes about as Drosophila. So it's tiny, but it has about the same amount of genes as a Drosophila. Um, and and it's, 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 it's highly compact. But although it's highly compact, and most of the genes are single exon, still, we find genes, so this part, this part, and this part are three exons. And in order to save space, they put genes in the introns. So it's really a sort of compressed, compressed, highly compressed genome. And here you see that everything is confirmed through uh, RNA-seq. Also, Tetranicus, this is an a uh, scanning electron microsco uh, microscopy picture. Um, you see also this highly diverse uh, kind of things. Has about the same, well, a bit more genes, actually, than Drosophila. Uh, but it's also very compact. It's not that big. Uh, but so basically 52% of this genome is coding for proteins. Um, and you also have genes and other things that are uh, in, in, in between things. And the, the special thing about this particular organism is that it is highly pest, pesticide uh, resistant. So um, this T. urtica can feed over 1,000 plants. Um, and it's sort of an spreading in Europe. Um, and um, it can actually live and feed on extremely toxic plants. Like one of the plants, I don't know if you know it, but oleander is a, is a sort of a bush, um, relatively big bush. And 
it's extremely toxic. Basically, if you chew a leaf, you might die. So it's it's and and this one is actually happily living living on these. Um, and and by doing this whole genome, we saw that um, this organism acquired genes through horizontal gene transfer. So basically, it has 16 genes that are uh, ring cleavage uh, proteins. Uh, and because many of the toxins, the, the secondary metabolites that plants produce, are composed of different ring structures, like benzene rings and, and so on, basically they inherited or acquired, rather, uh, genes from bacteria that are now in their genome, present in their genome. They can express it like it's their own genes, and they use it in order to detoxify those secondary metabolites to actually cut those rings in pieces so that uh, the whole uh, protein loses its um, loses its, uh, its 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 function. Also, P450s are quite important for circular. For, um, for for modifying uh, molecules and proteins, and so uh, what we saw, uh, and this is also um, a proof that the, those ring cleavage genes are really part of the genome. So this was the sequence, and those are the optical maps. So the both show that actually those genes are indeed in the genome and are not from a bacteria that was sort of a contaminant or something. Like that. Um, and what we've um, seen is that, uh, so the London strain, that's the strain that we, we sequenced, um, if you grow it on beans and you um, apply a uh, pesticide on, on those, you see that, well, basically the strain, they die. So the, the mortality is, is quite high. But if you take the same organism and you um, rear it on tomato for a couple of generations and you apply the same um, pesticide, you see that with this one there's barely any uh, lethality. So basically in tomato, tomato leaves makes a certain second metabolite that activates a gene in those organisms that can actually uh, also detoxify this particular pesticide. And because it has so many genes for detoxifying plant secondary metabolites, it's a very annoying little pest because if you apply um, 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 pesticides, it's just a matter of expression in, uh, of genes to see whether this, uh, this organism Will will serve, survive or, or or not? So in the whole population, there might be a few individuals that anyway overexpress a little bit more this gene in natural condition, and if you apply this 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 uh, pesticide, they will survive. All their others will die, but they will survive, and they will start a new population. And but that population will be automatically completely resistant to your uh, pesticide. So it's a bit the same thing as with antibiotics. If you abuse or misuse uh, antibiotics, well, basically, you will end up with resistance. Another um, organism on which we're working is um, Copidosoma. This is a little wasp, parasitic wasp. So it puts an, one egg in the egg of a caterpillar. Um, and the, the special thing about this little uh, wasp is that from one egg, two different morphs develop. They have the same genome, exactly the same genome, but one uh, part of, so basically, the one egg that is put in there um, is um, growing, growing, growing. And at some point, it will fall apart in several pieces, basically like, like, like twins. So, and every sub part of the, the initial egg can further develop. But depending on whether they have um, um, 
depending on the content or the types of cells that are in the little subparts of that egg that fell apart, it will develop in those two different morphs. One of the morphs will be like a, like a worm. And it will be developing very fast and it will be swimming basically in the caterpillar body. The other ones, they will develop completely in to all the way down to mature uh, wasps. And basically, the, the function of this morph is to make sure that no other egg, no other um, um, parasite would actually infect the caterpillar. So that the caterpillar will, will be only um, there for, um, for, for its twin brothers and sisters. And actually, once the, 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 the wasps, the, 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 the twins that develop in, in full wasps are ready to, um, are ready to uh, emerge, basically, it, the, 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 the uh, caterpillar will, will die, and those morphs will die with the caterpillar. So basically, those will sacrifice their life in order to make sure that their twin brothers and sister will survive and will have the best chances to survive. You have some, some basically some model organisms like E. coli, the, the human, yeast, mouse, the zebrafish, Drosophila, the fly, Arabidopsis, C. elegans. So you have basically the most common model organisms. Um, you can you can also, if you have a database, connect with your database, or if you have simply a file, you can also click and, and choose a file. So here you have quite a lot of different files. Um, typically, the ones with a CIF are the networks. Don't know if I can maybe open it. Oh, not here. Uh, where will it be? Cytoscape. Um, I think I should. So see, the, the input files are quite simple. Just three columns with a tab in between. So that's actually the only input sequence that you have. Remember the, the presentation? You have a gene. This is PP means protein-protein interaction. And this is another gene. So basically, the gene LAT has a protein-protein interaction with GRB2. But LAT has also other protein-protein interactions with other ones. So basically, in order to generate the input data, it's quite easy. You, you could even do it with Excel even with Excel. And so if I go back and I open, which one I open? I don't know. Okay. Human. So unfortunately, with the projector, my screen is quite small. So here you have the whole network. And of course, it's not so nice. Layout. And you can basically move things. You can try to change the layout. Because now it's just a square layout, a matrix. OK, still quite a lot of interactions. So basically, you can choose uh, different layouts, like here. Circular layout is the, like the most common one. Uh, maybe I can zoom. Uh, yeah. You need a Uh, but actually, I wanted to zoom in on this little bubble. Uh, 
and down here you have some sort of isolated little networks. Um, maybe I should. Skills. Finally, I want to say thank you, Stefan, for being here with us, for sharing his uh, knowledge and sharing his experience in bioinformatics science. Also, I want to say thank you to all of you for attending this course. I'm sure that this experience will serve you for your scientific careers. Thank you so much. Well, thank you first for uh, Juliana. Somewhere also Aminel, he sort of put it in motion um, to, to s basically bring me all the way down here. It's my first time in Ecuador. It's actually my second time in South America. So the first time was in Brazil, Fortaleza. But I only stayed like a week just for work, so back and forth. Uh, this time I will stay a bit longer. Uh, plan is to go and visit the Galapagos and, and a bit, go a bit around. And well, thank you all for being here first to have to, to and to come back also every day even though I'm okay my Spanish is not good so I couldn't do it in Spanish but even though that you manage to follow and as much as possible I guess I hope or you were able to help each other um, so I wish you a lot of success I hope it even if it's it, it you won't be able to continue much I hope actually the purpose was to open your eyes, to, to let you see what's, what's out there, out of Ecuador, uh, what's, what possibilities are there. And, and actually, so I don't know in which year of university you are, but it doesn't matter. Think about that if you work hard, <clears throat> you can apply for um, a grant, maybe be hired on a project, whatever. You can go to the US, you can go to Europe, you can go everywhere and make sure, but in order to do that, make sure that you're a good student. Work hard. It pays off in the long term. Maybe not in the short term, but in, definitely in the long term. Um, so it, it's worth, it's worth the investment. Try to work hard and if you make really good impression and you work really hard, you're a good student, you might get a grant, and then you can actually explore even the world, you can go abroad, and you can start doing science and, and, and then even come back after a couple of years and to actually apply your, all your knowledge back in Ecuador. So I hope it will inspire you a little bit, and I hope, I wish you the best, good points, good scores, and maybe, who knows, somewhere in Europe or in the US, we might meet again. Or maybe I've come back. Thank you. <laughs>